Hi, this is Nancy Rolfsma with On Point TV and Quilting with Nancy. We are at the final episode of our quilting series, The Great Basics. So The Great Basics took you through all of the basics that I've been teaching for years, from the how to pick your fabric and power cutting and folding in nine patches, and being able to make some really cool setting squares and triangles. The want you to know that on our website, we do have a few other projects, products. There is the Learning to Quilt book. So this is the book that started it all. This has eight different lessons taking you from all of the things in Great Basics and then going into half square triangles and flying geese and applique and cable borders and a lot of other fun, important things that you need to know for quilting. So Learning to Quilt is available on our website, which is www.onpoint-tv.com. There's also the pincushion pattern. So this is my pincushion pattern, which you'll see that I'm always wearing and there's a lot of different colors available. So go to our website and pick the color that you would like. And this is the book that the series we're working through now. So this is the great basics. So let me show you some of the quilts that I've made so far. So this was my original great basics quilt in these colors. And remember, I kind of used the stripes for the palette on how to pick my other fabrics. And that was in the first episode. Then there is the blue quilt. Again, I did, you can see easily that I used that stripe with the green and the blue and the turquoise to pick my colors for this. This quilt and the pink one I'm gonna show you next, the fabrics and kits are available on firesidequilts.com. So you can go there to get my book and the fabrics for all of this and any of the tools that I might use. So the blue one is just about done. I do need to still so hand sew the binding on, but we'll get to that later today. This is the one that we're gonna work on now. So last time we were together, we did the quilting. So I took you through the steps for all the free motion quilting designs that I used on this quilt. And now we're ready to make our label. So to make the label, looking at the back of the quilt, this is the back that I've got. So my label fabric, I've chosen just one of the ones from the front and mainly because it's light enough. You need your label to be light enough that you can see what you're going to write on it. So this is the fabric that I'm going to use. And I had had this strip had been already cut into a six inch, uh, six and a half inch. So I'm going to now cut it into a six and a half inch square. Now I'm going to cut it into a six and a half inch square. After you have it square, then you want to press it with some spray sizing. So I'm going to bring in my ironing mat and my big iron. There it is, under there. And using the Mary Ellen, so I do love the Mary Ellen spray sizing, but I'm going to put it into a mister bottle. The mister bottle just makes it go a little bit um, farther. And when you're putting it down, you don't have to squeeze it so many times to get it out. Just one time and it comes out. So you want this to be fairly stiff, maybe even a little stiffer than I normally do. So when I'm doing my quilt making, I spend a lot of time using spray sizing to make the fabric stiff enough so that when I'm working on it, my blocks are really laying flat and I just think it looks so much better. I also do this on the quilt backing and that's what we talked about in the machine quilting portion of the pattern. So now it's stiff, not, well, I don't know, maybe about as stiff as a piece of paper. Now you're going to fold this in half. So what I love about this particular label design is that you're only going to end up sewing one side of the label down. The two raw edge sides will be picked up by the binding. So in the end, you're only having to sew one side down on the back. The next question is what tool do you use to mark on your label because there are so many. A few months back we did a video where I used the fabric quill pens from We Are Memory Keepers. So I love, they've got some smaller sets too, but of course there was one with lots of colors, so that's the one that I bought. We Are Memory Keepers from American Crafts is the main company. They do so many craft items, most of them in scrapbooking. So it really surprised me when I found these that were actually in fabric world with us. This is one of the ones that I really like. Then there is Pit Pens 
from Faber Castell. I love these pens for so many different things. They have a wonderful brush tip on it that is really very sturdy so you can color in your design. So if you're using a really light colored fabric, you can color in your designs. And the video that I talked about with the fabric quill pens, I used my brother Scan and Cut to do all the writing and the designs. Then there is the Micron pen from Sukuniko. Now this one's been around the longest. I think I've known about this one and I've used these longer than any others. But it's there's also another one from Faber Castell. The idea it has to be an acid-free Indian ink which is going to make it archival. So it needs to be able to get through the wash and then it's a matter of how it writes. So when you're writing, having it stiffen, so I'll write on the back side of this I guess, you'll be able to draw and see which one is writing the thickness of the line that you like. So for instance, when I get one of these pip pens, you can see that I can get a very thick line. I love, love, love these ones from We Are Memory Keeper. Oh, gotta get it out of there. Because it's got a felt tip um, head, so it really writes nicely. The information that you need to put on the label is first and foremost, your name. You want people a hundred years from now, when they pull out your quilt, to see who the artist was that made that quilt. So that information is the first thing that goes on. The second is where you're from. We want to know, are you from Kansas or are you from Nova Scotia? They like to know where the quilts are from. And oftentimes, like our Grand Rapids Public Museum, they have a huge selection of really, really old quilts. And they know that they've all been made in the West Michigan area. So it gives it kind of that regional feel. So you want to be sure to put where you're from. So Grand Rapids, Michigan. Being very cautious here that I'm spelling everything right. Um, because if I'm not, I have to do it all over again. And Michigan. Okay, I just stumbled there a second. What come, how do you spell Michigan? <laughs> and the last thing that must be on is the date. Now you can just put the year, that's usually sufficient, but sometimes you might be making it for your favorite niece. And so you might want to put, you know, happy birthday, Athena. And then if you could remember what her birthday was, you would put it on the label. It's in January sometime, I'm not exactly sure. But I just usually put the year. So this is 2020. That's what you need to put on the label. What else you put on the label is really up to you. You can be very, very elaborate. You can be very, very simple. You also, depending on the backing that you've chosen for your quilt, you may just write all of this information right on to the quilt. When we come back, I'm going to show you how we're going to put this down onto our quilt. So now I have the quilt back that we're going to put this label on. So when we did the quilting, the first line of stitching that we did was here on the border. The second line we did was on the outside edge of the quilt. And I told you that was mainly to keep the border still when you were doing your quilting. But it serves another purpose. When you do that line of stitching, you know where the edge of the quilt is, right? Even from the back side. So if you look now from the back side, you can see this is that line of stitching that is now representing the entire back line of the quilt. We're going to take our label and place it just over that line so that the binding will grab it while those two edges while we're stitching it down. So if you use your Roxanne's basting glue and the Roxanne's glue has this really fabulous tip so that you can leave dots of glue you don't need a lot, but I don't want to have to leave pins in it when I'm sewing my binding down, so that's why I'm going to use the glue. So just enough of that glue, then take and position it down in that corner. So I know where it's got to be because I know where that line of stitching is, and that line of stitching represents the edge of my quilt. So now my label is in place, and when we're doing our binding, we will be covering these two edges. And we'll only have to come back and hand stitch this down. So we have our label done. Now it's time to learn how to put a sleeve on your quilt. 
So this is the positioning of our label. Generally speaking, at the bottom of the quilt, in one of the corners. It really doesn't matter which corner. And I say generally speaking, because if you want to change that up, go for it. Put it wherever you want. But I usually put mine on the bottom corner. And then at the top of the quilt is where you may want to put a sleeve. Now sleeves are used for hanging. So if you're making a twin size quilt that you know is never going to hang on the wall, there is no reason for you to put a sleeve on it unless you think you might put it in a quilt show. Most quilt shows now require that you put a sleeve on the quilt. So if you think there's any way that that quilt is going to be in a quilt show, then you want to put a sleeve on it. Or if the quilt is made to hang on a wall. And I know places where you can put a king size quilt on a wall. So anytime you're going to do that, that's when you want to put the sleeve on. So on the top of the quilt, using the same kind of idea, we know where the edge of the quilt is from the stitching that we did so that'll tell us what the placement for the sleeve is the fabric that I'm going to use is generally going to be the same as my backing not always and the reason not always is because sometimes I just don't have enough fabric and so I'm going to use whatever I can find to do the job coordinate not coordinate yeah doesn't matter sometimes if it's a big quilt that is only going to hang in a show once I'll put the sleeve on and then end up taking it off so I won't quite do it like this but then it might even be muslin so when you get your fabric ready you want to take that piece and you need the piece to be as long as the quilt so this is just a smidge longer either way but you cut that sleeve fabric the length or I'm sorry the width of the quilt and it's cut eight inches wide so I have an eight inch wide piece of fabric cut the length of the quilt then on the two ends fold it under approximately an inch on both sides and press it now some people at that point like to do a line of stitching to keep that in place and that's just fine I've not found it to make any difference at all so I don't take the time to do that then fold it in half so that is my sleeve now it's time for the placement so just like with the um, label I'm going to use my Roxanne's glue and I'm going to put dots of glue this time right on the quilt itself right there on that seam line and again I do the glue instead of pinning or clipping because I want it to stay in place when I'm putting my binding on and I don't want to have to deal with any extra pins all the way around the quilt so just a few more dots or swipes whatever you want to call that I'm doing here do, 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 do. hold music there we go oops got an extra thread to about an inch from the edge then put the raw edge of that sleeve on that line of glue just passing the line of stitching so it'll be approximately an inch and a half to two inches shorter than the quilt itself. I'll just let that glue dry. I won't secure the bottom end. The bottom end is not secured until later and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So now we have our label on and our sleeve on or at least basted it on. Next it's time to do our binding. Now it's time for the binding. So for the small size of the Great Basics quilt, we cut the width of fabric because the quilt's only 44 inches wide and we had cornerstones. So our strip of fabric didn't need to be very, very long. 44 inches was plenty. So for this quilt, I am going to cut the binding the width of the fabric. Keep in mind that if you're doing a larger quilt, like the twin size of the Great Basics, you will have cut your, bind, your border the length of fabric along the salvage. If you do that, then you're also going to cut your binding the length of grain. So you would cut your four border pieces and your four binding pieces. For the smaller version, the one that's just the 45 inches wide, we're going to cut it the width, and we're going to cut our strips two and a quarter inches so here's my fabric rolled and cut just so rolled just like I do it um, in the very first episode so you can take a look at that and now I'm going to square off the right hand edge whoops didn't get my clean cut 
but I kept my hands in position just like I always tell you I love it when it really works on TV now I'm going to turn my fabric around now I need to cut five strips that are two and a quarter inches wide so if I add them together for power cutting I have one two three one two and a quarter four one two and a quarter so I'm going to five eleven and a quarter inches lining up horizontally and vertically gonna cut my first strip then slide it back two and a quarter inches second strip third two and a quarter inches and two and a quarter is not that hard to add up two and a half is obviously easier but if you do it a lot two and a quarter is not that hard and then my last one will be my two and a quarter so I will have five strips and then it's going to be time for us to go to our sewing machine so I can show you how we put these all together so I've taken my strips to my sewing machine so let me show you how we do this I'm gonna set my machine up with the normal length and I've got my leader in position already now take your first strip and lay it down horizontally in front of your sewing machine the second strip lays down vertical so it's making crisscrossing over top so when you're sewing you're gonna start from the top left and sew to the bottom right which is why I like to have them overlapping like this so I can very easily see my starting point and my ending point so I'm going to chain piece from my leader right into the starting point and then continue all the way to the end now you may draw that line if you want and make that an easier line if, to stitch on if you want to okay so now I've gone to the bottom of my next strip so that very first the second strip that I put on this is the bottom of that here's my third strip and again it's gonna just lay crisscross over the top and I can go from one strip to the next so you can chain piece these together there's the bottom of my third strip here is the top of my fourth crisscrossing after a while you'll find this to be quite simple to do but I did find when I first started quilting that I was constantly sewing instead of from the top left to the bottom right I was sewing from the top right to the bottom left which obviously doesn't get you anywhere it has a major strip longer so you want to sew from the top left to the bottom right so that it makes that strip longer and we need to be on the diagonal because that will make the bulk of that seam much less when it's on the quilt if you do this just with a straight seam you'll have a very bulky seam on your quilt so now we're going to go and do the pressing now we have them all sewed together so that's what it looks like when you have them all sewed together in chain piecing you want to cut those apart and then cut this off so that it's about a little bit more than a quarter inch seam allowance I like it to, I'd say it was maybe three-eighths of an inch or something so it's a little bit bigger of a seam allowance you'll do that all the way down the line then at the beginning of your strip you want to take the beginning strip lay it right right side down and fold it at a 45 degree angle and press it now trim that off to a half inch seam allowance that's our folded end now we're going to take that entire strip and fold it in half so take your time don't stretch it now this is a straight of the grain binding so it's not too too easy I guess to stretch it but it can happen so just be sure that you're folding it in half not stretching it as you go and when you come to those intersections you're going to press the seam open so open that seam up press and then continue to fold it in half then you'll do this through the entire strip and when we come back I'm going to show you how to put this onto the quilt so I have the binding all pressed in half it's one long piece and this is the piece we're going to start with the one that has that 45 degree angle I like to take the rest of the binding and just put it behind me over my shoulder just to keep it out of the way 
I want to know where my label is. Generally speaking, I'm going to start sewing about maybe 20, 30 inches away from that label corner. I've set my machine up with what I'm going to call a fat quarter inch seam allowance. Whereas the normal quarter inch seam allowance, the needle is closer to the edge of my foot. Now I'm going to move the needle a little bit to the other way. So a true quarter of an inch plus a smidge. We call that a fat quarter inch seam allowance. Here is my beginning piece. Now I am not going to start sewing there, but I am going to put a pin there so I won't have that flop around while I'm sewing and I'll know when it's time to stop. I'm going to start sewing about six or eight inches away from that. Now I have put my walking foot on and on my machine that just is this little lever on a faff you get this built-in walking foot. If you don't have a faff this is time to attach your walking foot to your machine. And I'm going to start sewing. Now when you're sewing the quilt can get kind of cumbersome because it is kind of heavy so just be careful that you keep the entire quilt up here on your table. Also, this would be a good time to put a new needle in your machine. If your machine has been doing all of the piecing and the quilting, you want to be sure to get a new needle in place because it's going to be going through four layers of fabric and the batting. As I'm coming here to the end, use your awl to keep everything in position. And we're going to stop sewing about a quarter of an inch from the edge of the quilt. So if I put my awl here, that tells me to stop when the needle gets to my awl, then do a back stitch to lock it and cut your thread off. Now pull the quilt out and turn the quilt so you'll be sewing down the other side of the quilt. And this is the corner fold. So first take and fold the binding up. So this should create a 45 degree angle from the corner of the quilt. And here you have the angle also. So it's a nice straight angle. Now fold down. When you're doing that down fold, you want these edges to be, these folds of the binding to be one on top of another. The raw edge in line with the raw edge of the quilt and the fold to be low. You don't want this fold to be above the edge of the quilt. You need that fold to be just below the edge of the quilt. That makes it so it's actually square. I don't know why, I just know that it works. Now we're ready to start sewing here. Start, oops, I was in reverse, so let's go straight. You do not you need to do a locking stitch there. Now we'll go straight and we'll continue all the way around the quilt until we get to the end. I am now coming near the end where I actually started. So down here you can see where I actually started and my um, pin is showing there. So that reminds me to, hey, slow down, get ready. You're gonna have to stop here in a little bit. So I'm coming up on the end. So here is that end. Oop, my pin had come out. So let me put that pin back in that I had pinned at the beginning. And as I come up to that end, right before I get to it, I'm gonna take my scissors, there we go. And I can see that this is the overlap. So this is where the tip is, and then this is where I started sewing. I'm gonna cut on the diagonal right there so that this can now tuck inside that original fold. So use your awl to get it all positioned, tuck down inside. And now you can continue the sewing going through all those layers at once. And that's what's gonna make the, um, you kind of get that finished edge right there. So when we cut it off, you'll see what I mean. So this is can't even find it. It's, so there it is. This is the finished edge, that initial fold that I did. So when it's gone going um, around the quilt, there it is, that folded finished edge. So next we're going to hand stitch this down.
Now you can see that the binding is completely sewed around and this is the time that I cut off the extra batting and backing. People have asked a couple of times, when you're gonna cut that off? Do you cut that off? Not until the binding is on. So when you're cutting this off, you want to leave some extra batting and backing and let me show you why. So I'm leaving maybe, oh, I don't know, a little more than an eighth of an inch going all the way around. It might get trimmed off a little bit more, but as I come to the corner, I want to trim, cut that corner off to eliminate some of that bulk. You'll know if you have enough, if when it goes to the back side, it is full. So that edge is going to the stitching line and it's full. So go take your time, cut all the way around the quilt, remembering that if you cut it larger, you can always come back and cut it off small. Now I have all of the extra batting and backing trimmed off and you can see that there is extra batting and backing there. I don't want to trim it off right to the edge of the quilt. Now I'm going to use my quick clips. So these are little clips that you can get that are really helpful for the binding. And I just love this little bracelet that holds them. I just always thought that was pretty cool. It holds them all in one place. As I'm folding this over, the idea is that I want the edge, the folded edge of the binding to come to the stitching line. And in the process of doing that, still have some batting inside the binding. I'm not a fan of a binding that doesn't be full. It's got to be full of batting. So sometimes that means if I've cut it too far, I might have to bring the binding past the stitching line, but I choose best to have it come right to the stitching line and still have some batting right there in the gap. So if you'll take your clips, go all the way around your quilt, or at least on one side. Usually when I'm doing it, I want to get one side clipped before I start doing my hand sewing. Then you get to your corner. Now here at the corner, I can see right here that I've got a little bit too much of that. So I'm going to trim a little bit of that away. Remember, you can always trim away. You can't add to it. So it's all okay to have it be a little bit bigger than you thought you might need it. Now I'm going to do the corner. So on the corner fold, I'm going to start from the left side and bring that down nice and flat to the stitching line. And I'm going to put a couple of clips in on this side. And here the fold, right there where that point is, that point needs to go right to this corner. So the corner of the edge of the binding and the line of stitching. So if you'll just bring that down so it matches up right there. And then you can play with it a little bit until you get a nice sharp corner. And then clip it down. Now it will be time to hand stitch this down. Now here are some of the tools that we're going to use for hand stitching down the binding. FYI, these are pretty much the same tools that I'll use for hand applique, except the thread. The thread I use for hand applique will be a hundred weight silk, but for sewing down the binding, I'm going to use a cotton thread. So my choice of thread for this will be the Superior Masterpiece thread. This is a really nice 50 weight thread that I do most of my piecing with. I'm going to use this thread, not too long of a piece. I have a tendency to go too long, so if you measure it just to your elbow, don't go too long. You can cut the thread with your clover needle threader. This is a fabulous needle threader used for people that maybe don't have such young eyes anymore. Lay the thread down in the groove. And then the needle I'm going to use is a Roxanne's number nine, I think, nope, number 10, a number 10 between. So it's a small needle, but for me, a small needle gets me smaller stitches. So I'm going to pull it out. I just want to show you this is my little needle case that my friend Sue in New Zealand made me. Isn't he adorable? So here's my little needle, been saved there. Put the eye of the needle down in the little hole, loosely hold the thread and push the lever. And when you pick it up, your needle is threaded. It's just amazing. Now I'm going to cast the thread onto the needle. So crisscrossing the needle with the thread, then bring the thread over. And now the tail of the needle is through this loop. Pull that until it goes all the way around. So it's like it's been cast on like as if you were doing knitting 
and then it slides down. We have another video done a little over a year ago that I do this with a big thread. So we'll post that at the bottom of this so you'll have a good link. Now the thread is on the needle and I want to coat it. So I'm going to coat it with some thread magic. The thread magic is a silicone conditioner that will help seal the thread and keep it from twisting and make it a little bit stronger. So if you'll just run that thread through the top of the magic and then cap that up, then I like to run it through one more time. Now I'm going to use a thimble. You're always going to use the thimble on your middle finger and that's for helping to push the needle as you go. My favorite thimble is these really inexpensive ones from Collins. Um, they might actually be called something different now. It might be a Dritz and thimble, a Dritz adjustable thimble, but I find them to be the most comfortable. So use a thimble that you're comfortable with. Now we're ready to stitch. So as we stitch, Start kind of between two of your clips. Start your needle away from where you want to start. So I want to start stitching here. That means I'm going to put my needle into between the layers of batting over here. Then I can push it through and go until the tail disappears. So right there, you see the tail, you see the tail, you see the tail. Now you don't. The tail is now gone. Now I'm going to take a little knot stitch here. So just grabbing the edge of the binding and a little bit of the quilt. Pull the thread till there's a small loop. Pass your needle through that loop. And that should create a knot. Then I like to make it a little stronger right there at that very first one. So I'm going to do that knot one more time. Pass it through the loop and make a knot. Now I have a very good connection. So for stitching it down, I'm going to take a stitch that's a little bit less than a quarter of an inch. I don't want them to be too big, but they don't need to be so small as hand applique. So if it's going in here, it's going to travel a little short of a quarter of an inch and come out just on the fold of the binding. When the needle goes down, it goes off the fold into the quilt. So I'm traveling between the layers of the quilt into the batting, and then it comes up again on that fold of the binding. You take your time going all the way around the quilt in this manner. I like to make a knot about every five inches. That way if over time those binding stitches did come out, if I have a knot it will secure it. So my knot again is just going to be going into the quilt a little bit, into the fold of the binding. Wait till that loop gets small, pass your needle through it, and there you have your knot, and then you can continue sewing. So as you're going around and you'll get to the label section, on the label, remember that you need to hand stitch down the top folded edge. And then you'll do the same thing with the sleeve. So if we look at the sleeve here, here's the sleeve, oops, that we've stitched down. So it's all in place. The binding, of course, will come over and secure the top edge, but then you'll have to do the stitching down here on the bottom. So I find I'd like to give it a little bit of ease because inside the sleeve, let me show you from the corner, inside the sleeve will go a pole about the size of a curtain rod. So you want there to be a little bit of extra room there for the sleeve so that it doesn't bulge out on the front of the quilt. So if you will kind of leave yourself a little bit of play here as you're stitching down the bottom edge of the binding, then it will look really nice on the front of the quilt when it's hanging up. Now our quilt is finished. We've gone through all the processes of all the great basics needed to make a quilt using the Great Basics book. Now remember the Great Basics book is available for purchase on the website onpoint-tv. I generally only mail it to domestic customers because it is so expensive to send out to our international friends, but you can purchase the ebook. So the ebook is less expensive and it has all the really important and links to all of the videos while you're going through the book. So it's really a great idea. So please follow us on YouTube. You can like our channel and please go to our Facebook page and follow us there. That's where we can do a little bit more communicating than we can here on YouTube. If you have any questions, my email is quiltingwithnancy at gmail.com 
I want to thank you very much for joining us for the Great Basics series.